Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I am your host, Jason Turner. I'm available for code reviews and on-site training. In this episode, I want to talk to you about how to write C++ the right way. Yeah, it might be a little bit of a clickbait title, but I have some points that I'd very much like to make. Now, the main key point in the subtitle to this episode needs to be we are currently in a golden age of C++ tooling. Let's go ahead and start with a disclaimer here. There are other programming languages that basically have many of these things built in. We do not we have to go out of our way to enable many of these things. Now, do trust me that this is going to be a rapid fire episode with lots of information coming at you, and you might have to review it. You might need to go check out this video description for a lot of these links and information that I'm gonna be discussing, as well as, of course, you know, buy a t-shirt and a best practices book while you're down there. So in C++, we have the tools available. Yeah, we don't have these things built into our language, but like the $6 million man, we do have the technology, we have the capability, we can build this language into what we want it to be. So the first thing that you absolutely need when writing C++ the right way is a continuous build environment. Uh, this is basically non-negotiable for modern development. It's impossible to stay up on all of your warnings and errors and whatever to make sure that you are, you know, doing the right thing with your code. Uh, there's plenty of free options out there. There's GitHub, GitLab, Jenkins, uh, etc. I don't know, there's there's really a ton of options here, so I'm just gonna ask, what's your favorite? I think you need to just go ahead and comment and just let me know, like, what continuous build environment did I leave out that you absolutely love here? But you probably have one already. If you don't, use one of these that are available. Now, the next thing is maybe slightly contentious for some people. You need to use as many compilers as you can. Obviously, there's GCC, there's Clang, and there's Visual Studio. Let's just refer to that as cl.exe. Perhaps less obvious is Clang CL, which emulates the Microsoft compiler and runs on Windows. It can be a drop-in replacement for cl.exe. Why do we need as many compilers as we possibly can? Well, because Different compilers find different warnings. This is critical to making sure that you are writing standards compliant code. You need some sort of organized testing framework. Now, I know I'm going to miss your favorite one here, so you absolutely have to comment on this one. But we've got DocTest, which claims to be the fastest test framework for C++, compile time testing framework. Absolutely, check that out. And then we have Catch2, which has been going through a lot of reworks lately. And, you know, yeah, I have my browser in dark mode, and it's kind of funny to me what the logo looks like in this case. So I'm just going to leave it like that. But Catch2, also on GitHub, free, open source, easy to use. And then we have GTest, which is one from Google, and we have Boost Test. And of course, we have your favorite that you need to comment on and make sure that we are, you know, covering all of the options here. The key is that it has to be something that's easy to use. Now that you have test, you need test coverage analysis. There's a few options here. I want one that's going to show up in my dashboard 
that my continuous build environment has. So in an ideal world, I have my continuous build environment hosting continuous test coverage analysis. This can be moderately difficult to set up, but there are some tools that can help you with this. First of all, I want to mention coveralls, which I have used in the past. And this gives you a historical timeline, code coverage analysis, integrates with GitHub without any difficulty. And then I want to mention CodeCov, which again, you know, these things are largely free for open source projects. And you can choose to pay for them if you have a closed source project. And then probably something else that I'm missing that is your favorite. And of course, leave a comment and tell me if you've got some sort of test coverage analysis and reporting that you want to mention. You know, it is definitely critical that you have some sort of historical tracking because we really need to know if we're regressing here. Now, the next part is where I know I'm going to annoy many of you, but we're going to do it anyhow. You need as much static analysis as possible here. This is going to come in the form of at least dash all extra shadow conversion, pedantic, and error if you are on GCC Clang family of compilers. And if you are on Visual Studio, then we want W4 and W error, which is called WX on CL.exe. Okay, now I consider this to be a minimum. If you don't treat your warnings as errors, then you are not going to take your warnings seriously. You need to take your warnings seriously. And I know, because I've had this argument with all of you at some point on Twitter, that most of you don't like this one of dash w error, and most of you don't like dash w conversion. But hopefully you watched my episode on the PlayStation jailbreak that never should have happened. That was trivially catchable with dash W conversion, and you're willing to take it seriously today. Okay, so that's bare minimum. That's the compiler. Now, GCC has a relatively recent analyzer option, which will have links in the video description but you can see it is attempting to build its own static analyzer straight into the compiler. Now, to be clear, static analyzers are things that execute by analyzing the source code. They are not runtime checks. And then, of course, we have Visual Studio's static analyzer that's built into its compiler. I say, of course, but very few of you actually use this, I know from training. And then we've got CVP Check, which is a free and open source static analysis tool as well that has built in integration in CMake. And we have Cling Tidy, which also has built in integration with CMake. And there are other tools that are free for open source use, such as PVS Studio. And we've got a whole wide range of tools from Sonar Source, Sonar Cube, Sonar Lint, Sonar Cloud, all these things that can integrate with various levels with your tools. And there's, of course, your personal favorite that you know, I want you to comment on. I know that there's a pretty good chance that a lot of you are going to comment on static analysis tools that are written for C, not for C++, and they don't actually do a very good job of analyzing C++, go ahead and leave them as comments. They probably don't work very well with, you know, something like C++ 20, but you might still be using them. I don't know. Okay, as much static analysis as possible. Now, the next thing that you need is runtime analysis during testing. Hopefully, you are familiar with the sanitizers. Undefined behavior, address, memory, thread, these things all do a runtime analysis of your code with built-in compile time instrumentation, GCC, Clang, and Visual Studio all have varying levels of support for these tools today. 
and they are absolutely amazing, and they must be enabled during testing. Otherwise, you're not going to catch your memory errors on your test, which brings us full circle as to why we need code coverage analysis, because we need to make sure that we're actually testing the things that we think that we're testing so that we are getting this runtime analysis of the code that we're testing that we think that we should be testing. That's all a good idea. Now, the next couple of things that I need to mention are considerably slower than the sanitizers, but they work when you cannot compile your code specifically to use the sanitizers. And that is Dr. Memory, which I find is a tool that very few people know about. It is considerably faster in many cases than Velgrind, and it has the advantage of actually working on Windows, which is quite the thing, because Valgrind does not. Which of course means that I need to mention Valgrind, which can do many of the same things that we can get from our sanitizers. It kind of looks like this. Most of the things that the sanitizers can do, Valgrind and Dr. Memory can do. Unfortunately, at something like 20 times the additional runtime cost. So not necessarily an ideal situation here, but they are tools that are available. And then you should also be aware that your compiler implementation has debug checked iterators. Now I'm not going to put links to all this right here in this conversation, but there will be links in that video description I keep telling you to go to. And you can look at the lib standard C++ and the Visual Studio checked iterators links. Now the next one is one that I'm going to spend a lot more time on in a future episode, but it is fuzz testing. Now the idea of fuzz testing is that there's a tool that generates random and novel inputs to your API. You need this because it's going to use your API in a way that you would never think of using your API. And this is a good thing because you use your API correctly. It does not. So it's going to find all of your memory errors and undefined behavior in your code. Fuzz testers are extraordinarily good at this. So it is key here that when your fuzz tester is running, you have all of your runtime analysis enabled, just like you do in the case of using runtime analysis during your regular designed unit test. And that brings us to the final thing here. Chip with hardening enabled. And I don't think I have had a single class or student who has ever said that they do this. So I'm gonna do a relatively high level overview. We have Control Flow Guard from Microsoft. If you're using Visual Studio, Microsoft recommends to always deploy with this because it helps prevent people from forcing your binary into an undefined behavior situation effectively. And then we have Fortify Source, and this is used by GCC and I think Clang. It's disturbingly difficult to get specifics about it, but it basically is recommended for shipping your binary with Fortify Source enabled, and it has similar overlap to something like Control Flow Guard. Your compiler probably has a stack protector option that you can deploy with as well. And then this one is worth noting. I'm going to do this like this. You don't want to deploy with address sanitizer because this actually, it widens the attack surface area on your binary, but undefined behavior sanitizer actually has this feature called minimal runtime and you have to set up some specific options and again there's links to this in the video description well there's a link in the video description that will take you to all of this but it has a small attack surface library that you can use to effectively outlaw certain types of undefined behavior in your program. And if you're going to use this, then you want to be aware of these. 
that to determine if your program is going to print a verbose error and report and continue, which is the default, or print the error and then exit the program in the case of hitting undefined behavior. You should definitely choose wisely what you use here in your deployed binary. Okay, uh, so there you go. Now, the last thing that I'm going to share with you is that a lot of these options already exist in my use the tools section of my CBP best practices repository, which is a forkable coding standards document that you can use in your project for your team, whatever. I'll have a link to that also in this information that you'll be getting in the notes for this episode. And a lot of these things are set up also in my best practices CMake template starter project. So be sure you check all those things out. And again, comment, because I know many of you have favorites here that I overlooked. Let me know what I missed. And thanks for our watching this episode of C++ Weekly. Uh, be sure to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up.